third thing that is strange about our conference. <laughs> Never heard of keynote that to Robert starting early, but we can do that. All right, so uh, it's actually a real honor to have Robert second year in a row. Uh, he was here last year, took the train from Mumbai to Bangalore, was <laughs> dare enough to do that and survived. <laughs> Worries, right? Someone said, "Take first-class air condition." I did that; it was fantastic. <laughs> so yes, so I can recommend it seriously. So basically, he survived, and this year he's back again. <laughs> 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 we'll see where he goes. Uh, but anyway, uh, without much ado, I'm going to get Robert up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. So yes, so I I'm Robert Verding. Um, I was one of the three original Erlang developers together with uh, Joe Armstrong and Mike Williams. Uh, so it's, it's one third my fault. <laughs> and if you watched Erlang the movie, which I'm not going to show you, uh, if you watch that, it's Joe and Mike who are talking, I fix all the bugs. Right? <laughs> so I do the work. So yeah, yes. Um, if you're going to watch that movie, watch the sequel. That's, that's, that's better. You have to have seen the first one to understand the sequel, but the sequel is much better. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about something completely different. Here. Well, not quite. Um, it's a pilgrim's progress to the promised land. This is what this is what it's all about. Um, let's see if it, this works. Does it work? Yes, it does. Okay. So what what's this all about? So, um, well, you're here. You've heard the prophets and their followers extol extolling all the benefits and virtues of the Alang el elixir. And it's the true path to the promised land of concurrent systems. Um, well, c even more, land of concurrent, fault-tolerant, scalable systems. Yeah, no more buzzwords here at the moment, but there are other buzzwords as well. And, and you decide to try and make this, make this pilgrimage. What is going to happen is you're going to hit a number of different issues. We, we're going to talk about the various stages you get to. Um, you're going to hit these issues, and the thing to make sure is I don't want to make, they should not become problems. There, there, there will be issues, you will hit them. How to make sure that when you do hit them, they do not become problems. So this is what this talk is a bit about. And the first thing to ask yourself, of course, is, are you following the right prophets? I mean, there are a lot of prophets out there, but are you following the right prophets? Um, we're not uh, saying here, that they've been lying to you, because they probably haven't been lying to you. But is, are you listening to the right ones? Is this really where you want to go? So, yeah. Have you chosen the right path? Is our Lang Elixir the right language and system for you? So we, we might be talking about languages here, but it's actually, in both cases, they're a language together with the system. You cannot just get the language. Well, you can, but you don't want to. The language, you get the system itself the way of building things, etc., like this. So th is this really where you want to go? Um, I am not here going to get into discussions which one is better, Erlang or Elixir. Uh, take your pick, choose it. I prefer LFE, list flavored Erlang. How you cannot write things with parentheses, I, I can never understand. <laughs> but that's the absolutely best one for it. But I'm not going to get into that discussion. And in many ways, it, in many ways, it doesn't, make, it doesn't matter. So, so in some cases, you'll end up in the same place. Uh, in some cases, other different languages have different features which might be very interesting for you. But that, I'm not going to worry about that. So the question is, is this the right thing for you? What's it all about? Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, talk a little bit, a little history. I'm not going to make this very long. Try and try and explain why do they look like they do. I mean, there are an awful lot of languages out there uh, with different backgrounds and different <coughs> ideas. Why do these languages look like they do? And the other thing was here that um, when we were developing Erlang originally, okay, we came from Ericsson, which is a telecoms company, and we were looking at better ways, we thought better ways at least, of implementing telecom systems. And one of the things we realized is that controlling the switch is not the problem. Because there was a switch there. There, there, there was already software for controlling the switch. 
you would send the switch a few, a few signals and, two, and two, um, two users would then start talking with each other. That wasn't a problem. Or send, them a few, send a few more commands to it and the phone would start ringing, something like this. That was not the problem. These were the type of things that were the actual problem for designing these type of systems. Um, you have things like very large number of concurrent activities. What have I said here? Yeah, well, I'm not going to go. Some of them more interesting than others. These 12 points come from a thesis Bjorna Decker, who was at the boss of the lab, wrote later about these things. And there were these 10 features here for that he described as fundamental to this type of application. So the, some things were more important than others. They're the ones I've marked in red, or more interesting than others directly from the outside. You have things like a very large number of concurrent activities. Um, that was fundamental to the problem. You might have a large switch with hundreds of thousands of connections. You might be running tens of thousands of calls at the same time, plus everything the switch is doing. And you have, you have all of these things going on at the same time. It has an awful lot of concurrent activity. Uh, we have timing, pr timing constraints. Things have to happen at a certain time or within a certain time. Uh, we have things like distribution. Um, I think Fran I don't know if Francesco, Francesco mentioned it this morning about distribution in, in Joe. So Joe Armstrong says, if you want to make a distributed system, you need at least two computers to make a fault-tolerant distributed system. If you, if you want to, uh, otherwise, if, one if you have one machine, it might crash and the system goes down. So you need some form of distribution. Interaction with hardware and very large software systems, that's nothing special. Um, continuous operation over many years. So again, this was the requirement from, from these type of systems that they should not go down. And you should not have to take them down if you're doing upgrades. You should be able to do upgrades while the system is running. Um, same thing with software maintenance and things like this for it. Uh, you have, they have to be fault tolerant. Things will go wrong in the system, but the system is not allowed to crash. That's all there is to it. Um, so how do you make fault-tolerant systems? And I just want to point out here, what we're saying here is that, is that not that there w won't be errors, there will be errors, but when errors occur, the system must be able to handle those errors, control them, and make sure the system can continue afterwards. Uh, and these things were not um, optional. If we could not design a system which can do all this, it wasn't interesting. That's all there is to it, right? And what you find is, when you start looking at this, there's absolutely nothing about telecoms in there. It's a certain type of system with a certain type of property. That's what we're looking at, really. Um, unfortunately, seeing our language was felt or deemed to be a telecoms uh, language and a telecom system, I think some you scared off some users who weren't doing telecoms. But there's, there is nothing about telecoms in there. And this, this makes a few other things as well. This, so this was the problem. So where did we end up about this? Change my glasses so I can read something. Here. Um, so where, wh what we ended up with in designing a language and a system around the language, they, they were designed at the same time with these properties in it. So we had lightweight, massive concurrency. This was built into the basics of the system. For us, it was almost as important as being able to make a function call, which had lots of processes communicating with each other very, very efficiently. There has to be support in the very basic system for building fault-tolerant systems. And these are things you can't put on top of the library. They're so important, they have to be, the primitives have to be in the very base of the system. We have to be able to handle timing constraints, which means, amongst other things, the system must never block. It, this is just... I mean, the system can't stop for five or ten seconds doing a garbage collection because it's just not allowed to do that. So we had to, we had to think a lot about designing the system, uh, partially the language, and often, often about the system and the implementation of that to make sure the thing does not block. And if you look at the current beam today, it is very difficult to make it block. You can do it, but you have to put an awful lot of effort into doing it. You just your normal code will not make it block. Um, it's like an operating system. You can have an operating system running with a lot of process doing heavy load. It might slow down the system, but you will not block the system. Well, you shouldn't. Anyway. It's the same thing in the Allen systems as well. Um, continuous operation and continuous maintenance, there is support for doing code handling. 
the loading code while the system is actually running, and it's very well defined. Well, one of the problems doing that is what happens if I redefine a function which is actually in use? Some, some process is using it, another process reloads that function. This has to be very well defined so you can do that. And that's one of the properties of the Erlang system for handling code is that it is very well defined what happens when you load a module, reload a module. And we need primitives for distribution. So yeah, um, this is the type of thing Erlang and Elixir, which runs on top of it, of course, is designed to do. But we're not good at everything. Uh, we, we have never made that claim. Um, if you, someone says that, says that Erlang is good for everything, uh, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're lying. And the typical number of things is what we are not good at is, say, heavy number crunching. We can do it, but we're slow. So if you want to do a serious heavy number crunching, you would not write it in Erlang or Elixir. Um, if you've got something where global shared mutable state is the best way to go, we don't do that. We just don't do shared global mutables. That's it. Um, again, if, you, if that's something is fundamental to your system or your solution of the problem, then you have to go somewhere else. However, 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 we are very good at interacting with other systems. So from a very early time, we were sort of polyglot in our way of thinking. Y you would have things written in other languages talking with Erlang. <laughs> so if you need to do heavy number crunching, write it in Fortran and then control it from Erlang. That's a typical way of doing it. Other things as well. I mean, typically you will, ha you will have things for your system written in other languages. So why use Erlang to interface it? And we're very good at doing that. So this is the type of system that Erlang, and hence Elixir, is designed to, to run on. This is the type of thing it's designed to do. And also some of the things it's not designed to do, but we can do it. So the f that's, that's the first stage of the system. The idea is, am I following the right prophet? Is this what I want to do? Is it something else? Go somewhere else. Um, the second stage here is the joy of the first experiment. I've made some experiments in my system I've made a simple tool, I've downloaded the system, some tools, and I've built my first simple experiment, and I'm happy because it works. It might have been um, simple Erlang or Alexia Sober or a Phoenix web page. I can knock one of those up in an hour, and it works, and I'm re really happy about that. That's great. That's, the first, that's your first stage. So now you feel um, driven to keep on going, to working with this, because I want to do more. And the next stage you're going to get to, I call the village of confusion. Because you're going to hit, you will hit things that just don't seem right, depending from where you come from. And the first one, the village of confusion, um, the system is working, but it's behaving strangely in, in some ways. Um, you've re have you really listened to these prophets when, when they're talking about this, about this and when they're describing the language in the system, did you really understand what they mean? And the trouble, what you, can, what you will very quickly run into is, especially from uh, the Alexia side, it may look like Ruby, but it's not Ruby. And to be seriously honest, uh, Alexia users who know what they're talking about and their, and their developers will not say it's Ruby running on the beam. They will say it is Ruby influenced. Be very aware of that. They're not saying it's Ruby, and it's not Ruby. It looks like it, but it's not Ruby. It's influenced. Um, it's not an object-oriented language. You can do object orientation on it, but it doesn't quite behave as other object-oriented languages do. I can, if anyone has questions, I can talk more about that afterwards, but some of you work with that as well, too. It has a strange way of handling data if you're coming from a normal OO language, and has a very strange way of building systems. It's not the same. And you will hit this. You will hit these stages for it. And the first one, the first one you'll hit after the village of confusion is the hill of function. It's only a small hill. It's not a big hill, but you have to climb it eventually. And the sooner you climb it, the better. And be, the, the thing here is now, um, yeah, simple understanding is not hard. It's a functional language. They are functional languages with the standard typical functional language properties. There's just no way around this. 
It's immutable data. That's it. And this is not a language feature. This is actually all the way down in the implementation. The implementation knows this and can use this efficiently to make things more efficient. Um, we have things like pattern matching in the data. Pattern matching is a fundamental property which is used everywhere. And once you get to understand pattern matching, you'll love it. But uh, until you do, it's just really weird. We have things like recursion. When you're, if you're coming from your typical OO language, you've been told don't use recursion because recursion's bad. We're saying use recursion because that's all you have. <laughs> Literally, you don't have anything else, right? So you have this problem that it's a functional language. And in most cases, what you'll find is it's just a standard functional language. Everything you'll find in the Erlang Elixir sequential language is a standard functional stuff. There is one exception, that's binaries, but I'm not going to mention those here now. So that's the first one. The second one is the mountain of concurrency. Um, get over it. Get up this mountain as quickly as possible and understand what's happening. And um, here, this is something we have, to, we have to climb up and understand, to understand how to build systems using this. Because it, it is different. It's not, it's not high, but it feels very different. It's just a different way of structuring and building systems. And until you understand this, your system is not going to behave like you think it should. You're not going to get all the benefits that from the Erlang Elixir system you've got. And we have things like, well, isolated processes. So yes, we have processes. We can have lots of processes. We can literally have millions of processes, but they're isolated. They don't share. There is no sharing of data. That's it. There is no global data. That's it. There are things that look like global data, but when you start looking at them and say, no, they're actually not global data. That's all there is to it. Um, how do you communicate between processes? Asynchronous messages. That's it. At the low level, that is all there is. Uh, we are not scared of creating lots of processes, as I mentioned. There are products running millions of Allen processes on one machine. Products in there for the money. And we aren't scared of crashing them. This doesn't come without problems, but we aren't scared of that. So yeah, we'll talk a bit about crashing things later as well. So the next stage you're going to get to, uh, I call the mist of frameworks. And this is nothing really Erlang or Elixir specific. It's using most frameworks as well. So when you're using frameworks, um, they can often create a deep mist around what's actually going on in the system. And to understand that, you actually have to go in and look at this mist and see what's going on there. So, um, so they, can, they can be very helpful. I'm not, I'm not saying anything against not using frameworks at all. I'm not. They can be very helpful. They can encapsulate behavior. They can hide lots of boilerplate code. Uh, they can provide default handling. Um, they can hide internal system structure. And in many ways, this is all very good because it makes it much easier for you to build your system. It makes it faster to get, it, get, get it things up and running to do that. But there's a big but. It makes it very difficult to understand what's going on because th you have to understand what's going on underneath, but the frameworks have hidden it for you. So they made things very nice by hiding it. They also made it very difficult by hiding it. And especially, w there are two, two sp especially two cases where you might, ne you might run into problems with this. I get an error. I get an error in the system. I've written something, something's going wrong. And I'll get an error report from something I have not written for starting process. I have absolutely no idea what they're doing and things like this for it because the framework has done all this work for me. And that can make er finding errors difficult. And the, the second one is, what happens if I've got my framework and I want to combine it with another framework? Therefore, they have to start talking with each other. And if that was not something that was originally designed in the framework, then I have to understand what's going on internally so I can make this connection between things. And a typical case with framework, frameworks is they will have a set of things they're designed to, work to do, to build, to build a system that does this. And they're very good at doing that. And they provide an awful lot of help for doing it. As soon as I start wandering out a bit, I have to start thinking myself, and I have to start understanding what's actually going on internally. So I call that, that's what I mean by the mist of frameworks. And again, this is nothing Erlang Elixir specific at all. Right? It, it happens with any framework you're working on, what's actually happening inside. And one of the mists that come from this is, well, it's the Marshall fault tolerant system. 
So you have this thing about building fault tolerant systems, um, which is one of the fundamental reasons for coming to, to this environment at all, is to be because we can do it, and we have proof of doing it. I mean, systems with five or seven nines reliability. I think five nines reliability is about five minutes per year or something like this downtime. It, it's at that level. And there are systems that do this. We can do it. But um, you have to understand what's going on. And it's a big marsh. This is definitely a big marsh. How do I do these things? Uh, there, are a number, there are a number of standard ways of doing it. OTP is one of them. But it's very easy to wander off and, and get just trapped in the bog and not get anywhere. So in some ways it's very easy, some ways it's very difficult to do this. And yeah, we need to pick a good one. And of course, OTP is the obvious one to start with. Um, there's a lot of support for it. It was designed for building these type of things. So if you start looking at the OTP code, you'll find it's actually quite simple, a lot of it, because it, this is what Erlang was designed for, originally designed to do for. I can write a supervisor in one page of code. Why? Because that's what one of the things Erlang was designed to do for. It just fits very nicely together, everything. Um, many of the stuff we've been using, most of them, uh, are already part of OTP. So if you're, you, you, you're in OXE and using packages, they're built on top of OTP. Because they're already using it all for it. Um, the underlying system, what's underneath Alexia, is built on top of OTP. So it's, it's all going all the way down. Every, it's used everywhere for it. Um, yeah, so extends the user and the extender. And the thing to be aware of is that it is actually extensible. Sometimes you find people, you discussions on the net where people get very work, very scared of this. And they put a lot of effort. They sort of see OTP as some form of um, system built in concrete with st steel around. And you can't do anything with it. That's wrong. It is extensible. LXC is a typical example. It's added things. OTP compliant things, it's added them for it because you can do that. The system itself is quite open and it's all implemented in Erlang for it. So you can, if, you, if you need something else which o the OTP system doesn't provide, you can write something which is OTP compliant, follow the rules. There are five rules for doing it. It's very simple. There's support in libraries for helping you do all this stuff. You've done that. You can just plug it in and it just works. So. OTP is an obvious choice. It is extensible. You can write your own things to it. Other systems do it. But, there's a but, of course. It does require a lot about thinking how your system should behave when things go wrong. Okay, we, no, we say when. Because we assume you're going to get errors in your system. Um, so, what, how, how, do you, how do I build my system in such a way that when things go wrong, the system survives? That's the whole goal of the whole thing for it. And that means you have to start thinking before, beforehand or in the early stages of what is important in my system. So if I'm using these packages or frameworks, they will do that for you in many ways. They will tell you, yeah, we'll do this. So if this, something goes wrong, this will happen. You just don't have to think about it and so on. But sometimes you just do have to think about it yourself in your system. So you have to sit down and sort of think about, okay, I've got these different types of processes going on. If one of these crashes, what do I need to do? Maybe I can just ignore it. I don't care. Um, maybe, I can just, maybe I have to clean up after it. It might have allocated resources, and I have to make sure that these re resources are now free. Or maybe I have to restart it. Uh, maybe it's something which is providing such a service in the system where, where if, if this is not running, this I cannot say the system is working. So therefore, I have to restart it. And there is support for doing all these things inside OTP, but I have to sit down and work out what I actually need to do. And when I do that, I have to structure my system to do this. And when that works, then I don't have to think about it anymore. So I've talked to people, developers, and they say that they have never thought as much about errors as when designing Erlang systems, because you do it up front. And w as I say, when it works, I can ignore it in most of the cases. I can quite happily write my code as if everything works, because when things go wrong, the process has crashed and the system knows what to do. And again, it works. It, it's a surprisingly simple uh, mechanism, but it actually works. So that's, that's another thing. Another one you will have seen is a double-edged sword of metaprogramming. So yeah, um, I'm a Lisper. Now you cannot write Lisp without having macros and doing metaprogramming. Well, you can, but no one does. 
So I'm very good off work. If you're running Elixir, well, running in Erlang in a small sense, but if you're running, especially running Elixir, you've been using macros quite a lot. Quite a lot of the system um, is implemented using macros. And that's good because you can make things quite clear. You can provide the right macros to make things more usable and more understandable and more readable. So macros have the power of doing good, but also becoming extremely evil. Um, so what do I mean here? So if I, they are a powerful tool. They, t they help me write code, at that uh, build code at runtime, but used wisely, they can be really helpful. I can write macros which say very understandable, very nice and tell me what's going on and things like this. Unwisely, they can write, they can generate completely incomprehensible code. So I can write a macro that does, that does 10 different things in different places and I have absolutely no idea what's going on. And you get extremely complex macros for it. And that's the bad size of it. And, and they, they can make things really difficult to understand. Um, you're already using macros. So if you're, if you're running, I mean, def module, def and def p, they're macros. A lot of the things, standard stuff, you're using are macros. There's nothing strange about this. Um, and they're, they're pretty understandable macros. Def, says define, def module says define a module with containing these things. That's nice. And def says define a function or at least one clause of a function containing this. It's pretty straight, they're straightforward. Um, but you can write very bad macros as well. And a common rule... Well, some people say very hard at it, say, w w when it comes to, to macros, don't use them. When it comes to using macros, don't use them. Um, I think that's a bit over hard. Um, I think a more reasonable one is don't use a macro if I can implement it in a function. If I can write a function that does the same thing, don't, don't do a macro. The macro does not give me anything. It gives me very little. The thing to remember, of course, is macros are evaluated at compile time. So when you're defining your own macros here, and sometimes using macros, you really have to keep track sometimes of where, when things are being done. Uh, that can lead you into very strange behavior if you get it wrong. So one thing that can happen, you can think your macro is being evaluated at, at compile time, but it's actually being evaluated at runtime because of the way you've defined it, or vice versa. You will think that things were being evaluated at runtime, but they're actually evaluated when the macro is expanding instead. So you have to be slightly careful there. So it's, it's a, they are a very nice tool for doing things well, if you use them correctly. Yeah, the next stage here is you find out to your horror that the language heaven is actually multilingual. <laughs> well, it's not one. It's not one language. So yeah. <laughs> and yes. So yeah, you've heard tales. It's multilingual. Um, and if you go and read on the, on the web, you'll find there's a bit of squabbling between the various languages in this heaven here, and they're fighting with each other, and which language is the best, and the, 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 the other side is wrong, etc. cetera. Um, all I can say is don't despair in this sense for it. So what we have here, what we actually have when we start thinking about it, is something we call the Erlang OTP, the, eco the Erlang ecosystem. And this is what it's all about. Um, we have a system, so the language of heaven, the language heaven of problems land is the Erlang ecosystem, and all the languages are running on top of the Erlang OTP system. So we have, of course, for example, if we, who's got a pen in as well? Hmm? Where's the pen button? Ah, that looks like a pen. Yeah, so we've got the Erlang OTP here. We've got the beam at the bottom. We have Erlang OTP providing the whole OTP system in a large, large number of libraries. Then we have a set of languages running on top of this. We have Erlang, of course. We have Elixir. We've got LFV. Yay. We have a prologue as well if you want to do that. We have a Lua and other languages as well. Now, the benefit of all this is that um, why? Because if they follow the rules, which they do, um, they can on openly interact with each other. I'm not locked down into one of them. There's no, there's no requirement of me to use one. And if they do, they do it properly, the system as a whole can be more powerful than any one language provides. Just because I'm using one of the languages doesn't mean I, can, I can't access libraries written in other languages. So um, 
a, typic, a simple example, we have Phoenix and Ecto for Elixir for doing web servers for us. They're written in Elixir, okay? And they're intended to be used in Elixir. However, they're running on top of a package called Cowboy for handling connections. And Cowboy is written in Erlang. And there's just no, I there's just no problem interfacing them. There's nothing strange about doing this. There'd be no, be no sensible reason for, say, rewriting Cowboy just, to, just because it's not done in Erlang. Or sorry, not do done in Erlang, not in Elixir. So this is not something you really have to worry about. Nothing, nothing scary. This provides a lot of, lot of benefits. I'll just point out one here. For example, if, if, if you have a something written in the ecosystem which can talk to other languages, in this case, for example, Java, any language in the ecosystem can use this and talk to Java as a base. They can build their own stuff on top of it. There is, a jo there is something in the, in the Erlang library that's called the J interface for talking with Java. It makes Java look like a, an another Erlang mode and there's a set of classes in Java for handling Erlang data structures, things like this. There's also a little added feature here, which I very much like. Unfortunately, it's not really been productified. There's something called Adjunct writing on, running on the JVM. It's an implementation of Erlang on the JVM. And it is a very good implementation of Erlang in that basically you can take your Erlang code and run it straight off there and it works. Um, for some things, it's, it's faster. In some things it's slower. You still have problems, as we heard earlier today, about the, um, the, the JVM garbage collection. It doesn't get around that, but it's, this is an alternative. Just an example thing for doing it. Um, we're working on something now we, we call Peerlang, which is for, is for a system for having Erlang talk to Python. So you could, write, you could have things written in Python, you can interact with them with, a, with an Erlang. Erlang can send messages to Python, and Python can send messages back to Erlang for interacting with each other. And this gets back to another thing I was mentioning slightly before is we have this very polyglot view of the world. And we, there is support in the ecosystem for talking with systems written in other languages. And we don't find anything strange about that. If you have something, a set of libraries or procedures that are written in another language, say Java or Python, which you find very useful and a fundamental part of your problem, fine, use them. I mean, trying to rewrite the whole thing in Erlang would be stupid. Use them, interface with them, and talk with them, and do that. We've been doing it from the very beginning. So the telecom switches we were talking about, they were written in some weird assembler Ericsson had, but we didn't have to, w we didn't have to worry about that. We could just send messages to it and, and get things to work with all they want. Um, one here, is, I call it the pool of introspection. That's the next stage. So I don't know if how many people have actually started using the introspection tools inside Erlang, if, if that is common or not at all. Um, this is more Erlang. Elixir hasn't got quite that far yet at the introspection, but they're getting there. Um, there is a set of tools. So you can sit down, sit in the pool, and look, at, look in the water and see reflections of yourself and your systems and what's going on internally for us. And you can look at the system while it's running. And now I'm talking production systems here. <coughs> Test systems are one thing, but now we can start looking at production systems and introspect on these and get information about what's happening while the system is running. So we can do things like, well, there are a number of standard tools. Uh, one I was talking, well, showing a bit earlier today when I was uh, with my spaceships, we have Observer, which is just part of the standard Erlang release for just introspecting and getting some information out of the system while it's running. We can look at load, we can look at load distributions, a lot of other things going on there. That, of course, works directly with Elixir and any, any other language running on it. This is not a problem. Um, we, have a number of we have a number of other tools. There's one called D DBG. Well, a quick push. There is a number of um, tracing. There are actually two, tra two functions for doing internal tracing of the internal system while the system is running. Um, so you can look at things like you can say which processes I want to trace, what do I want to trace inside those processes. Um, I can trace, for example, message passing in and out. I can trace function calls of specific functions. I can even trace things depending on which, are, which functions I'm being called by, which arguments they're called with. So I can do different tracing things on top of that as well. Um, I can trace other things. I can have a process tell me when it does garbage collection, for example. 
info if I want to start tracing garbage collection. There are, for example, in the standard Erlang system, three profiling tools. They all work on top of these tracing bits. And you get two tracing bits. But this stands for building functions to do this. Um, so DBG, that's part of the standard Erlang release. That's just another interface into these uh, tracing bits, which are quite a bit easier to run, sort of. Uh, the person who wrote those liked short function names. So if you start looking, you'll find a lot of functions with one with, uh, with one character name, two character names, three character names. There are some long ones with four character names as well too. And to understand what they're doing, you will not find you will not understand that from the from the function name itself. But they're short to write from from the shell. DBG is meant to be run from the shell. Uh, there are other tools. There's Recon and Redbug are, are common third party tools again for doing introspection, uh, looking at the system. It's not just the tracing as well. We have a commercial product, Wombat OAM, for looking at systems and looking at distributed systems and networks, uh, getting information out of that as well too. Talk to Francesco about that. Um, these all work in Erlang, but the mapping to Elixir is very straightforward. We're just talking about looking at data structures and yeah, they, they look slightly differently, but the, the mapping between them is very straightforward for us. So here you'll see ri something written in an Erlang data structure. And if you're coming from the Elixir world, you have to see the, uh, this one of these. There's no big problem with that. <laughs> so I well, saw one very funny tweet about that. We have a, we have a, a map data structure. So if you write that in, in Erlang, you write it as um, hash curly braces for the, for the fields in. That, hap that hash happens to be a comment in Elixir. So in Elixir, you write it with a percent curly braces, which happens to be a comment in Erlang. Right? <laughs> so yeah, it's very funny. But apart from minor details like that, it, the, the mapping is very straightforward, so there's no, no, big no big deal about that. And these things are meant, as I said, these things are meant for introspection on running systems. And it is very easy. If I have a running system, I can have a shell running. And from a shell, I can do anything. I can introspect, I can load code, I can do whatever I want while the system is running. Um, and I have these tools to help me look at the system as well. So yeah, that gets us, well, to the final stage, at least in this part, is the joy of arrival. We've actually built our system. It's working. Um, it can handle everything you expected it to do. It can survive errors as you hoped it would. And it just keeps going. So you can run your web server. It will run there. It might get a few errors. You might lose an occasional connection, but the server will just keep going. It will not crash. Everything will just keep recovering as you want it. And all I can say is rejoice. And the path actually wasn't as difficult as it first seemed. The trick is to realize you will have these issues and be prepared to meet them. And the longer you push them, the longer you delay them, the worse they'll get. So, for I mean, the simple first case, yeah, these are functional languages. That's it. Get over it. Once you get over that and get used to it, everything else works. Until you get over it and use it, you're going to get very strange errors. So just the same thing with start building the systems as well. Too. And, yeah, that was basically what I was going to say. Um, that's me. And questions? No questions? Clear as mud?